previously on Hannity Type Matter Programming, uh, we, uh, <laughs> we built this uh, universe uh, closed under uh, 0, 1, 2, sigma types, pi types, and uh, trees built as uh, fixed points of indexed containers. Uh, and then I kind of rather hurriedly um, uh, rushed through um, uh, the, um, I kind of waved the observational equality construction at you. I thought it might be worth uh, doing at a slightly slower pace so you can see how it goes. And I thought, just for a laugh, because I'm uh, disrupting myself, uh, I would adjust the universe very slightly before I started. You remember I was talking about how equality proofs are always uh, in this uh, fragment using just 0, 1, sigma and pi that have no strict pattern matching operations. Well, I thought I would nail that down slightly more tightly by building a universe, by, by, by cutting out the propositional fragment of this universe. You see, this universe has, has data types in it, but we can build a propositional sub-universe of it quite easily. So what I'm going to do is just add a new data type called sort where set and prop are the sorts. And then I'm going to make this uh, to write sort arrow here. And I'm going to say who is definitely in sort set, but uh, that uh, for all, you know, there's a zero and a one in both set and prop. Uh, and what's going to happen here, let's be a little bit careful. have to treat sigma and pi slightly differently in that uh, S sort is that because sigma is contravariant in both components, uh, then both set and prop will be closed under sigma. Um, but here's the good bit. Spurt sort the figure is sorting itself out. Yes, so although when we make the pi type at once at any sort, the range of the pi type will have the same sort, the domain of the pi type will always be a set. So you can form you can form propositions by universally quantifying over sets. Whereas here you can't form, you can't, you can't have a proposition which is existentially quantifying over a set because then a proof would contain useful data. And the object of the exercise here is really to show that proofs are in the, that this prop is the irrelevant fragment of, of the theory. So I'm ruthlessly excluding useful information. Uh, we could, if we wanted, um, uh, and we could, if we wanted, choose that there are uh, trees in prop as well as in set, uh, and that would correspond to adding a notion of inductive prick to the logical language, as well as inductive families and data types. But uh, I don't want 
want to do that because I don't need deductive predicates to do this construction and they would have a strict pattern matching principle which we would have to be careful not to use and <laughs> I want to fix things so that there are no strict pattern matching principles available for prop even if, you know, in case we were to use one by accident. But what, when you say strict, what do you mean by strict? I mean that uh, they uh, pattern match on the structure of a proof and require it to have a uh, canonical form in order to make computational progress. Um, so, uh, if, I, I guess the distinction I'm drawing is between eliminators uh, like uh, uh, application and projections uh, which uh, uh, which are uh, lazy uh, versus pattern matching a pair against uh, the the pairing constructor. So, so if you have something which takes uh, uh, which takes a proof of a pair and you pattern match against the pairing constructor, then you require a canonical proof. Whereas if you just take its two projections, then it will compute. Uh, without the proof needing to be canonical. I mean, that, that's, that's the point. Is that, uh, uh, that you can always take projections. That doesn't cause a computation to get stuck. Whereas waiting for the pair to actually be built from the canonical pair constructor can cause a computation to get stuck. Um, so all of these types which have only one constructor uh, that then get turned into record types and have eta rules uh, have this sort of lazy form of projection style eliminator which is what lets us guarantee uh, that uh, computing with these proofs is not going to get stuck. That's the object of the exercise is to deliver a coercion machinery for transporting values between provably equal types uh, that, uh, that won't get stuck because the proof isn't of the right form. Uh, well, I have one last thing to add, which is a constructor that says if you have a proposition, then you can form the set of its proofs. And hopefully I don't have very much to do here. Oh, I'm going to make 
takes um, two props. So I want to be able to form conjunctions, just ordinary conjunctions. And that's going to be P and Q is sigma P. That's just a non dependent. And I want to have implication with the same type. And P implies Q will be for all proofs of P, because pi takes a set as its domain. Give back Q. So that's just a little shorthand. Last time we said, okay, uh, uh, is zero equal to zero? Yes. Uh, are the elements, are two elements of zero equal to each other? Uh, well, you're lucky if you can find them, so yes. Uh, same deal with the unit type, it's equal to itself and all its elements are equal. Uh, and then for uh, the, the booleans, yeah, 2 equals 2, but in order to decide if 2 booleans are equal, you have to look at them. So that's what we do. Okay, so let's move on to sigma. Right. So, first of all, we have to answer the question, when are two sigma types equal? when they're equal component ones. So how do we spell that out? So of S has to be equal to S prime. And, and what? T and T prime need to be sort of extensionally equivalent. Yeah, so we need to say whenever you Feeling, when you instantiate T and T prime Almost. with equal elements of the domain, you will get equal types. So that we can say, well, give me an S and an S prime, and let's suppose they're equal. That should enable us to deduce that T S is interchangeable with T prime S prime. And we'll be able to pass that. And that's probably the need. That says right. No. Some capitals uh, no. are yeah. wonky. Yeah. Good. Um, and we also need to say now when two pairs Hopefully that will be easy. So if you actually give me um, uh, S T and S prime T prime, uh, then uh, how shall we say? Well, yeah. Under what circumstances are these two pairs equal? Well, they're going to be equal component-wise. So that's um, that. And here we see, uh, but so, okay, let's think. Yeah. If we were defining a homogeneous equality, then we'd only have one pair type, but we'd have two pairs. So this first equation would be homogeneous. This was like that. But, even if we were defining a homogeneous equality, the types of the second components would be different because one would involve S and one would involve S prime. So the fact that we're defining a heterogeneous equality anyway gives us enough slack just to write the thing that we need here, which is T S T T prime S prime T prime. It'd be true to say that's why. 
heterogeneous equality first to its extent? Yeah, so pretty much. I mean, it was always... Um, uh, so it's, it's exactly the strategy uh, that gets you out of dealing with things which are dependent and where the types, although they're kind of morally equal, are, uh, are only equal because there's a previous equation which only holds propositionally that explains why they should be equal. And uh, yeah, just heterogeneous equality makes the bureaucracy of that much more straightforward. You'll notice that this is, I mean, that's one of the reasons why I, I went to the trouble to define the non-dependent conjunction, is that even though somehow morally this equation is the one that explains why it's even interesting to compare those things, <laughs> it's still a flat non-dependent conjunction. There's no explicit dependency on this proof to allow the formation of, of this proposition. So the, the, the management of these dependent chains of equations gets so much easier when you use heterogeneous equality. As I discovered to my cost when I was doing my PhD, because I built the whole translation from pattern matching into, uh, into eliminators using homogeneous equality and explicit dependency on previous equations to force later equations in dependent types to become homogeneous. And it was extremely hairy to do that. And it was only when I had it implemented and working and started to write it up in my thesis and I was trying to explain why this was a good idea then I realised it's a bad idea. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I remember I was trying to explain why the formation rule for equality is the way it is, because of course it would only be interesting to compare two elements of judgmentally the same type. It was only at that point that it occurred to me that it was a really stupid thing to do. Uh, and uh, yeah, then I invented heterogeneous equality, did a few back of the envelope calculations and realised I had wasted half a year implementing the wrong thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh well. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, moving back to, to this construction, you've just done uh, sigma, let's do pi. So, um, when are pi types equal? Um, well, they're going to be equal component-wise, rather like sigma. Uh, to a first approximation, we can just uh, grab this and paste it in. But let's stop and think for a moment uh, before we commit. We're going to be using this information, this information about why the types are interchangeable to implement this coercion operation. So let's think, how are we actually going to coerce a function from pi st to pi s prime t prime? We're going to think we get a function in, we have to give a function out. So the function we give out is going to take an s prime. We're going to need to turn that into an s, feed it through the function, and then turn the result back into a t prime. So we're going to want to coerce the things in the quantum variant positions in the other direction. So why don't we make our lives just a little bit easier? by twisting the inverse side. Now, I'm still keeping t going to t prime on the right hand side, but the, on the inverse side, I'm uh, just putting that little contravariant twisting. Um, and then, uh, what? Now we have to say, when 
where two functions are equal. And this was, after all, the point of the exercise. To be able to say functions are equal if they are equal pointwise. And how do we say that they're pointwise equal? We say, give me an S. Grab that. Uh, and that. What have I done? Uh, oh, that's, that's, that's F. Yes, so that was the thing. Yes, and then um, things get um, slightly hairier uh, here. Well, it's the same stuff. It's uh, after a while it becomes um, uh, this one. I might dip into the notes and just lift the answer. Let's at least let's get started. It's it's going to be um, it's good, we're going to start off with it's going to be structural. We're just going to say all the pieces have to be equal in the obvious ways in which they can be. So say I interchange roll I prime and EQ I. I mean, it's one of these things where you, you take your spectacles off so you can hardly see anything. Uh, and then it's obvious what to do. Um, yeah. We can see this begins with abstracting over um, uh, yeah, F begins by abstract F prime begins by abstracting over I prime and F by abstracting over I. So obviously the right thing do is I'm just grabbing that and alpha converting. Um, obviously we need equal elements of I and I prime. Um, and uh, uh, yeah. Things to apply f and f prime to, so we can say let uh, s k uh, equal f i s prime k prime equal f prime i prime in question mark. Tell us what those things are. Well, that's astonishingly poor form that it won't tell us the types of the let bottom variables. Uh, fortunately, are well, they just yeah, down? Are they just scroll? Yes, I mean, I can ask. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so S and S prime are both sets. So, let's say that they have to be equal. Yes. function from S. Okay, good. Uh, let's say that we're going to need two equal elements of S and S prime. Okay, I'm just following my notes here. 
good. That means I've got something I can apply K to. So I'll just do that. I know I'll get a pair PR. Case adapting search. <laughs> uh, except that that's not what we want. Nearly done. Now I just need to say that R goes back equals things in each case. So we can say eek, and then what type does R give back? Well, it gives back the index that belongs to that position. So that's that RP as an element of I is equal to R prime, B prime, and I prime. Oof. Yeah, that was, I hope you agree, both long and boring. <laughs> <laughs> um, if it had been long and full of incident, then uh, this would be a much more complicated thing than it is. If we're just saying these things have to be structurally equal, and I mean, there was hopefully a moderate bit of cunning in getting the contrarian twist right. But it just, yeah, you twist the sets that are in contrarian positions. And then, ah, what do we do here? We have to say when two trees are equal. Well, I'm going to do that uh, with a helper function. And that's going to be Trees by structural recursion on trees. 
So that's that x and x prime. And then it chooses, it renames the nice names to nasty names. <laughs> I'm going to call that sk and s prime, k prime. Um, and what do we need to say? We just need to say that uh, s is s prime and, well, that k takes equal positions to equal children. Let's do that. So that's what's it? Where did S and S prime go? Oh, how annoying. Um, how annoying that uh, they are. Uh, ah, crap. Ah, ah. <laughs> no last laugh on it. Another, uh, yes, uh, that's, yes, first of F I, first of F I, I, You've seen the last one? No, it's not the last one. What? Okay. First. After the video. First projection. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, um, I learned my lesson. I'm going to say let S uh, K equal F I S prime K prime equal I prime, and then these will be S prime and S. Constructor of a record, uh, 
uh, it's always lazy. It really turns into projections. Uh, uh, so yes, so here, well, we've got to give back an element of the empty type. Um, fortunately, we've got one. Um, so we could just say, we could, <laughs> I've got a choice. I can do control C, control C, or control C, control space. <laughs> um, uh, in the sort of spirit of laziness, um, why try harder? Uh, okay. And I've got. I'm just going to rename things to have more intelligible names. And this X will be. Always that coherence is used to uh, 
uh, fix up the types uh, in dependent components. Okay, so that's the sigma done. That's 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 the easy dependent one. Uh, the tricky dependent one is on its way. So this again, you get an S cube and a T cube. This time, we get an F. Yes, that's uh, that's a lot to uh, to rediscover. sometimes fails to import fixities. What? <laughs> <laughs> Quite a common disappear to. Um, that's extremely disturbing because it knows what <laughs> it knows what signal is. Yes. It's an item it, scope, but um, I don't know what's going on there. If I can't fix it like that, I should be able oh, to fix it. Oh, I bracketed those two this way, didn't I? Now what? Um, what was the type? that we put there. 
He said, oh, I did actually nest, I didn't write nest them to the right. So let's just stare at that for a moment to see that it does the obvious thing. Again, what are we saying? We've got to translate a, a tree of the left hand type to a tree of the right hand type. And how are we going to do that? By structural recursion of the trees. And we stare at it. Uh, so, yeah, so we introduce a helper function. Um, re-abstract it, because we need, need to be able to do it in every possible index. So we say, okay, when tree is SK, we coerce uh, S across to an S prime. And uh, once we've got that, we can extract the uh, position sets and the indexing function, and then we give back uh, the tree, uh, I've got my tree constructor right at the outside, and then I give back a node which has the translated shape, uh, so the shape translated to the right hand side, and then a function from positions. So we are then given a right hand side position, and we have to coerce it over to the left so that we can apply. Uh, so we can get the kids of the left hand tree and then coerce them over to the right recursively. So it's the same, it's the same deal as we had with, with functions. Uh, the once again, uh, you know, everything is sort of reassuringly um, point-wise and structural all the way along. Okay, so that's uh, that's how the the bits and pieces uh, get built. And as you can see, nowhere uh, did we need uh, to you to step outside this propositional fragment uh, to uh, 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 to express what equality means. And our coercion mechanism, correspondingly, uh, is always able to make progress. If you ask it to coerce a canonical value between canonical sets, then either those sets have different head constructors, in which case the equation is false, or we have a computational mechanism that will make some progress. And in fact, we only care about getting a constructor of a tree. Right. We're even lazy when, when it's, it's the Booleans. We didn't say, oh well, see if it's true, and if it's true, transport it. <laughs> uh, we're happy to transport uh, from the Booleans to the Booleans without inspecting the value. It's only in this um, situation where we're uh, transporting trees that we pattern match on the tree, but not on the proof that the tree types are equal. So even though this is you know, this is the the moment in Return of the Jedi where the you know, Emperor Palpatine turns to Luke Skywalker and says, it may not look it but this Death Star is fully operational. Um, and, uh, um, you know, this coercion mechanism may be propped up by a postulate of coherence, but there's no way the coercion of values between sets can get stuck because of that postulate. There's no, uh, it's building a proof we have, by construction, ensured that all the computation in proofs is never going to demand that it gives it, that we have a canonical one. You know, it's always lazy. So we can, you know, this system will work perfectly well with um, with a postulated coherence. 
Uh, it's quite fun trying to prove coherence. You can actually get quite a long way, but uh, eventually you discover that you can only prove coherence if ACTA is natively extensional. And, you know, you know, um, back to the point where uh, you know you can't you can't make the meta theory extensional. Boil, it boils down to that at some point. The same thing happens if you try to prove that this equality is reflexive. You might hope it, that it would be reflexive. <laughs> um, uh, and you can think, well, why don't I try proving that by structural recursion on types? And you can get quite a long way with that. Uh, but uh, uh, at some point, uh, well, if you think about it, you know, we're really saying um, uh, if, we were, if we were able to prove that this equality was reflexive, uh, then we're really saying uh, that, uh, that you know, what, is, what is reflexivity at high types? It, it's saying that um, uh, a function will take equal inputs to equal outputs. So, uh, reflexivity for higher order functions actually is extensionality. Think about it. Uh, what, if you think about the function which takes a function and an argument and performs the application, what is it to say that that function is extensionally equal to itself? This will take extensionally equal functions and extensionally equal arguments and give you extensionally equal. So, so extensionality is baked into reflexivity. Um, uh, so again, that is something we're not going to prove inside this system. Uh, however, uh, we're in the, the, the fortunate position. There's actually there's some really nice property of, of this setup now, is that because we have engineered out the possibility of uh, pattern matching strictly on proofs. Uh, the only way that a coercion between canonical sets can get stuck, uh, uh, well, you know, in uh, yeah, if we're working in the empty context and we're coercing between two sets, they're going to be canonical because you only have canonical sets. Uh, in the empty context. How could that coercion get stuck? It can only get stuck if we manage to prove an equation between two incompatible sets. So what we're saying is that this system will compute canonically provided we can't prove a contradiction. So we're actually free to throw in whatever propositional postulates we like, as long as we have the good taste only to like propositions which are consistent. Um, so, yeah, do you like you know, add, uh, add excluded middle to, uh, uh, to prop um, and uh, have fun? Uh, uh, that's a nice consequence of, of this. And if you um, if you build uh, if you build a, a system like this type theory for real uh, uh, with a, this sort of prop separated out from the set, then you can actually make the judgmental equality uh, for elements of proof sets. You can just make that trivially true. Once you discover that you're comparing uh, two elements in proof sets, you just say, yes, they're equal. Uh, because you know that nothing that depends computationally on proof actually cares about distinctions between proof objects. Because it's always lazy. That's how you build a type theory with real proof irrelevance in the, the judgmental equality, you pay for that 
by making sure that all the computations on proofs are lazy. So that there really is no part of the machinery that discriminates between the different forms of, of proofs. You know, proofs actually are irrelevant <laughs> in, in that sense. Uh, so uh, if you think about, um, yeah, so it's a little consequence of choosing this, the, you know, the need, choosing this extension of equality, meaning that we have to define this transportation mechanism uh, that works by inspection of the sets. You know, it has the happy consequence that we find we didn't have to inspect the proofs, which meant we could have proof irrelevance. So it's sort of nice, nice byproduct. Let's yeah, so let's, let's sort of finish the job and finish the first half. Yes, yeah, so let's things to postulate. Uh, yes, yeah, so let's start with REFL, which is draw X in T set. Uh, and uh, there's something funny. Oh, I know, it's missing. There's something missing. Go back and put it in. Yes, there is an error in the above program, but I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, we're going to have E. Also going to postulate rest, which says row X in T set and uh, P in interpretation of X. So that's uh, also going to be set. I'm going to say that um, if I have x and x prime in uh, in x, then p x is interchangeable with p x prime. Those will just have check because it turns out that what's it known by? Oh, there's a thing. Part. So, what have I just said here? That actually enter functions uh, from X to our internal universal sets. Uh, uh, oh, uh, that should be said that they're always equal, of course. That should say um, if, uh, if we give them equal, if we have some internal family of sets. Instantiated with equal elements, we should get equal sets. Uh, and that allows me to define Substitution mechanism.